Hello, your pushers. We're back in this video series in discussing the early republic. We're going to focus on uh, primarily the Washington administration and the enforcement of this new constitution, whether it works, whether it can pass the test. And we're going to see the development of the first political party system between the Federalists and the Republicans, or as historians like to label them, the Democratic Republicans. Okay, the Constitution has been ratified by all the states, including little old Rhode Island, and we got to hold the elections. Got to elect a whole new national government under the Constitution. Got to elect the House. We have to elect the Senate, and we have to elect the President. The first Congress will meet for two years. Uh, between 1789 and 1791, we'll hold the elections in 1788. Uh, as you can see, the Federalists will be dominating, uh, have the majority in the House and a majority in the Senate. Uh, the Republican Party, not the GOP, the Republicans as in the Democratic Republicans, uh, just in case you get primary sources, uh, in, in this era, you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, and you see Republican as capitalized, they're referring to the Democratic Republicans of the party founded by Thomas Jefferson. Not to be confused with the GOP Republican Party as founded in 1854. So just to clarify, on that. but before they're even founded, uh, they're going to be those that are against the Federalist policies and the Federalist platform uh, or should we say, against Hamilton's platform, Alexander the Man Hamilton's platform, they're going to be, the faction in the Congress is going to be, uh, regard themselves as anti-administration. That's going to be their label. Uh, so this is going to be, for the first few Congresses, uh, the, the, the factions involved in that. But you can see that the Federalists are going to be the majority party in the Congress. So they're going to be enacting their agenda, their political agenda. Uh, meanwhile, we also have to elect a president. So remember that the president is elected by the Electoral College. Each state gets a number of electors dependent on its total representation in Congress. That means two senators, right? So two electors for that, and based on the number of their representatives. They at least each state will at least get one representative in the House. So each state will have at least three electoral votes, and they will have more depending on their population. Be on the electoral map. Uh, be, get used to this for every four years. I'm sure that'll help you try to determine uh, analysis and inferences based on the political environment of the era. But this is easy. The first election is without doubt not, not going to be competitive at all. Everyone realizes that George Washington, he's got to be the first. He's got to be number one. And he is elected unanimously. Every elector is going to cast their ballot for George Washington. And then it comes down to, well, who's gonna, how they're going to cast their second ballot. And John Adams will earn uh, the second place, in a sense. He will get the second most votes because that's how the Constitution has it set up originally. Uh, whoever gets the majority of electoral votes uh, and basically essentially first place is the president. Whoever gets second most electoral votes uh, or second place is the vice president. So it's not really by party because we don't have political parties right now. No, they don't, they don't exist right now. So that's not, that's not an issue. But John Adams will become vice president. George Washington will be unanimous. And it makes sense that George Washington is the president. He was the general of the Continental Army. And when he was general of the Continental Army, he did something that most People are, I would say almost everyone is impressed with and that uh, there has been, a, you know, a dreaded history of this happening. But despite being in charge of the Continental Army, he deferred to the civilian government, to the Second Continental Congress, uh, even though he had some of his officers uh, try to persuade him to assume command of the government, of the national government, uh, through the Second Continental Congress, and even on the Articles of Confederation, he absolutely refused. And that means we can trust him. And not only that, but he, he, he won. He won the Revolutionary War. Uh, so 
that, that we can trust him. He's going to be also elected as the president of the Constitution Convention. Again, we need that strong leadership. We need someone that we can trust that could uh, that doesn't seem to have any uh, apparent or evident interest uh, or can be influenced easily by certain interest groups. So it makes absolute sense to elect George Washington. And George Washington even himself understands the responsibility he has as being the nation's first president under the Constitution. He is going to be responsible for setting precedent. He is going to be establishing like this, what I do in these next four years, because that's, that's the term of the president, uh, it could be even more, what I do is going to establish the template for subsequent presidents. So, and I need to make sure that I, I, I enforce the constitutional law to the best of my ability, all right? So that's, that's the idea. But we can see that, you know, with all these states, they, they, they no question about his, his, uh, his administration in regards to uh, who, who, who is to be the president. John Adams, obviously very, very, very qualified for the position. Uh, he was instrumental in our revolution. He was instrumental in setting up our foreign policy uh, during the during the revolution. Uh, he wasn't he wasn't present at the Constitutional Convention. He was in Britain, uh, of course, uh, defending and representing our interests uh, to Great Britain. And so, but he is he is exceptionally qualified for the position. Uh, but he's not going to really enjoy it as president of the Senate. But that's that's how it is. This is a, this is George Washington's administration. He appoints an all-star cabinet by the way this, 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 uh, these constitutional advisors the constitution grants the president to seek advice uh from from these individuals and they can be uh, approved by the senate so he's going to have yes john adams as his vice president but he's really going to depend on the counsel of his secretary of state thomas jefferson all right yes you know, very very well qualified he's going to secretary of state pretty much at this point in time will represent, uh, kind of be like the nation's representative in foreign affairs, but also the Secretary of State in this era also pretty much conducts domestic policy as well, uh, but will definitely have foreign policy jurisdiction uh, in that capacity. He does appoint the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, technically his second choice, but uh, Robert Morris, who he con he consulted first, ref ref recommended Alexander Hamilton, and, and and thank you for that, Mr. Morris. Uh, his Secretary of War, Henry Knox, very dependable, uh, you know, military and, and and defense mind, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph, uh, again, qualified for the job. This is an all-star cabinet, and interestingly, he chooses the best personnel for these offices. He's not. He's not concerned about, you know, patronage and 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 loyalty to you know some party or anything like that. He chose these men because they were the best for the job, uh, according to according to him. Like that's what he wants. Again, setting precedent here. All right, so we're going to look at some some issues in regards to his administration because remember, we're testing the Constitution. The Articles of Confederation failed. Uh, it was too weak or too restrictive, as some will argue. So will the Constitution pass the test? Okay. Well, we got to get right into it. Hamilton is not only the Secretary of the Treasury under Washington's administration, but he's, in essence, almost Washington's right-hand man. Washington is going, we have to be honest here, Washington is going to defer much to Hamilton's judgment uh, and his policies. Uh, Washington himself is not going to attach himself to any political party. He is against them. We'll see that. But he does tend to lean more toward Hamilton's perspective uh, than anyone else's. And Hamilton is a nationalist. But what is Hamilton going to do? Okay, here we go. All right. This is going to get very technical, uh, especially when it comes to economics. So we got to look at Hamilton's economic plan. Again, we have to understand his perspective. He's a nationalist. He wants to, he, he, he's, he's a federalist. He was one of the co-authors of the Federalist Papers. He advocated for a strong central government. He advocated for further empowering the national government, especially when it came to economic regulation. Understand that we have 
a Congress that can tax, it can lay and collect taxes, it can regulate interstate and foreign commerce, uh, including in these taxes and including in part of this regulation are tariffs. Uh, this, is, this, this, this comes with the, with the Congress's power. But Hamilton is also responsible for managing the nation's finances under this Treasury Department. And the American finances are a mess. They are an absolute, absolute mess. So let's quickly go back to one of the problems under the Articles of Confederation. Okay, so let's look at this image here about U.S. debt after the war. Uh, the United States uh, and the several states owe a total of $80 million. That would be back then totaled as in $80 million uh, then. Okay, not, not, in, not, not, not adjusted for inflation. No, no, no. That's $80 million back then. The government, it's the, 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 the national government itself, uh, owes 42.4 million. As you can see, this is uh, owed to soldiers for their salaries, for their pensions. Uh, this is to any creditors that they borrowed from uh, and their citizens, any debts that they have to the British uh, and loyalists. As per the Treaty of Paris in 1783, that was a provision of that treaty to pay back debts to Britain and, and to the loyalists. Uh, we also have the total state debt, meaning the debt of the several states that have debt. Right? For example, in Virginia doesn't have debt. Virginia paid off its debt. Uh, but other states do have debt. And coming out to a total of $21.5 million. And there are debts to foreign governments, foreign uh, and special interests there, uh, such as France and Spain, who uh, helped us in the war. And of course, we borrowed from them. We also borrowed from the Dutch. Uh, we even owe the, I mean, that's, you know, it's also the British, but that comes out to, you add all that up, right? 11.7 million foreign debt. You add that up, you get $80 million. All right. You got to pay that back. You, you, yeah, national government, you are responsible for that. And guess what? That's with interest and you got to pay the interest on that debt and the interest needs to be paid on time. That total debt, what you borrow from yeah, over time, over time, and you know, there's. But when, when some of that debt is through bonds, and that means that those bonds will mature. So after a point in time, the 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 whoever is in possession of that bond needs to get paid. So the federal government has to be responsible for that. So are the states. Uh, interest has to be paid on time, because you can incur penalties on that. You can incur further interest. And the interest on that $80 million could run about between 4 to $5 million, which needs to be paid. So where is the federal government going to get the revenue, right? Where is its source of funding to pay this debt, along with paying for the day-to-day -day operation and facilitation of the federal government? So here's what Alexander Hamilton has proposed, and he proposes to... President Washington, and he proposes it to, uh, which will be introduced to the Congress to decide and deliberate on. All right, his economic plan includes assumption of the debt. What do we mean by this? All right, so he writes these reports on the public credit, and one of his proposals is that the federal government will assume not only the national debt, which it ha I mean, that's what it has, but it also will assume the debt of all the states. And so it will assume that $80 million in debt. Why would it do that? Because again, it's like, whoa, <laughs> all right, we're, we're already struggling to pay off the debt that the national government already has. Now you want to assume even more debt? Hamilton, what's your point? What's your, why would you do this? All right, well, um, Hamilton is just doing what I've explained in regards to the, you know, you know, Developing your own debt, your own credit. You have to assume debt to build credit. And Hamilton's argument is that by telling debtors and creditors that they are assuming this responsibility to pay back this debt and that they will have a system in place to not only pay back this debt, but to manage it, that it will uh, develop, it will promote more credit, it will promote more trust in the financial. Uh, system of the United States, and that will help to foster and facilitate commerce and trade with 
foreign powers and facilitate even more borrowing to pursue uh, other projects down the line. That's the, that's the intent here. That's what you mean. Okay, cool. That's 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 reasonable, right? Can this federal government do that? Are there any concerns with this? This is where Jefferson shows. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. James Madison becomes Thomas Jefferson's protege. Yes, that same James Madison that was the co-author of the Federalist Papers. He is going to start leaning more toward Jefferson camp. Why are they concerned about Hamilton's plan to assume the debt? Uh, really, it's the state debt because their argument is that by the federal government assuming the debt of the states, that the states will be beholden to the federal government, which means that according to them, the federal government will have much more influence and control over the state. That's, that's also a reasonable perspective. That's also a reasonable argument to, you know, maybe even a legitimate concern over this plan that the states will be further uh, indebted, no, you know, no pun intended, uh, to the federal government, expanding more of that influence and power of the federal government. All right. But let's now continue with Hamilton's economic plan. How do we manage this? How is this going to be facilitated? Right? Hamilton will, again, propose another uh, element to his economic plan. He writes the report on a national bank. The federal government through Congress will establish this institution, this national bank, this first bank of the United States. The institution will be responsible for collecting the revenues from the taxes imposed by Congress. It will hold on to those revenues and have it deposited into this institution. It'll help to establish a national currency, which Congress is enumerated to do. They are, they, there's a one, going to be one uniform currency, one national currency, no state currencies, one national currency. The bank will help to foster this new currency and it will be managing the debt, how to pay the debt and manage even more debt. That seems, again, that seems reasonable. However, let's dive a little deeper into what the, how this institution is actually structured. Hamilton proposes that the federal deposits, right? That means revenue generated, you know, revenue collected and generated through the federal government will be deposited into this bank. But this bank is going to be mostly private. It's going to be a private institution or quasi-public. What do we mean by this? Only 20% of the stock or shares in this bank will be held by the federal government or held in public hands. The rest of it, 80% of it, is going to be held in private interests, private financial interests, private bankers, private investors. Even some British foreign investors are going to have their hands in this. 80% is going to be in private hands. Why? Because why does Hamilton, you know, suggest this? Well, that 20% keeps it in public hands. So there is supervision, there is control there in regards to being responsible with people because it is in charge of the federal deposits, it is in charge of the federal revenue that is collected mostly through this taxation. But in the private hands, it helps to facilitate the management of this debt and these financial uh, policies and details. Uh, in much more efficient means, uh, the, those finance, those financial uh, personnel are—they're the best. We want it in more capable hands to foster this this financial system. Okay, maybe for some of you, you are like that seems concerning, and you're not wrong because Jefferson and Madison be like, whoa, no, 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 I don't like that part. That doesn't sound cool, right? And there are some constitutional questions about this bank, right? Is the bank legit? Is it constitutional? Because when we go back to Congress and look at Article One and the Constitution when it comes to Congress, does Congress have the power to establish a bank, a national bank? And no, it does not. It is not enumerated in there, absolutely not. 
It's not. You won't find it anywhere. You will not find the word bank in the Constitution at all. You won't find the word bank in the Constitution even today with all the amendments that have done, been done. But So where does Hamilton get the idea that this bank is constitutional, that it is legit? Well, we go back to understanding the necessary and proper clause, the elastic clause. That's where Hamilton is going to exploit that power that Congress has. Congress does have the, 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 the power to make all laws necessary and proper. But again, let's clarify this. It needs to facilitate an enumerated power that already exists in Article 1, Section 8 that the Congress has. What, what, what enumerated powers are we talking about? I think it's evident now. Congress can lay and collect taxes. That's what the bank will do. It'll help them manage the collection of the taxes. Congress has the enumerated power to uh, adjust the debts and, and, deal, and pay the debts. That's what the bank will do. Congress has the enumerated power to establish a uniform currency, national currency. The bank will help to facilitate that. There we go. There, there, that right there. And, and in a way, we could even make an argument that as part of Congress's, uh, Congress's commerce regulation, the bank will help to facilitate as well in, to a degree. Those enumerated powers are going to be facilitated uh, through this bank as necessary and proper. That's Hamilton's argument. It's a sell. Jefferson and Madison are not <laughs> gonna, uh, that, that, that's their concern. It's like, see, that's what's gonna happen. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I knew they were gonna do that. I knew they're gonna expand the federal government. But we'll get, we'll, we'll get to how we, how we handle this. Another part of Hamilton's plan is, okay, how does the federal government generate revenue? They are going to do this through taxation. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Remember, in the revolution, right? No, no, taxes, don't like. Don't like taxes. No. Right? No taxation without representation. I get it, I get it. But hey, taxes were paid anyway, right? Colony, colonial legislatures enacted taxes. Colonists paid their taxes. I get it, but it was a, I get the rallying cry, and this is again some of the some of the you know framers and, and, and the people here are going to be like, whoa, 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 that, I don't like paying taxes. Well, Hamilton suggests that all right, here you're going to be your sources of revenue, your main sources of revenue. One tariffs. Tariffs are okay. Now we cannot pass export taxes. Constitution actually prohibits that. Congress cannot pass any export taxes. We cannot tax goods to be exported. Uh, the southern states were adamant about that. They didn't want their cash crops like tobacco or rice or cotton to be taxed on exports because they didn't, that was a lucrative market. Their foreign, you know, foreign demand for their cash crops is, is very lucrative for them. And they didn't want to lose any revenue on it. So they prohibited the export tax. That's actually part of the whole com commerce compromise there. But tariffs are okay. Taxes on imports are a okay. And that actually is. It's actually mercantilist, right? Because tariffs, whoa, that was a major element of mercantilist policy. So Hamilton's plan looks, sounds, and breathes like mercantilist uh, because it kind of is. But uh, it, what you know, tax tariffs are acceptable. They were acceptable under the system as an indirect tax, and that's okay. Now he does have further perspective on these tariffs, but that is going to be the federal government's main source of revenue for some time to come. Those tariffs, uh, those taxes on imports. Another source of revenue are going to be excise taxes. Excise taxes are tax on specific goods uh, or even the, speci the specific use of a good. Uh, in today's world, gasoline tax would be an example of an excise tax. But back then, what Hamilton is going to propose in one of his excise taxes is going to be a tax on alcohol, or in particular, whiskey. Uh, we will talk about that, that whiskey tax uh, in a bit. Okay. So those are going to be the sources of revenue that will be collected by federal agents who will then uh, take those sources of revenue and give it to the bank, who will uh, hold on to those deposits to manage any spending that needs to be done for the facilitation of the federal government and to handle the debt. And of course, as a means to uh, coin money, right, as part of the national currency. That's the economic plan. Seems legit, right? We can talk about the merits of it. We can also talk about the concerns of it, and you know, we'll, we'll address that. But there was one more element to this. Now, Hamilton's going to propose all of this, but there was one more, and we want to go back to tariffs. And Hamilton 
is going to write a report on the subject of manufacturers. And here in this primary source that we have here, we have by Hamilton, the expediency of encouraging manufacturers in the United States, which is not long since deemed very questionable, appears at the time to be pretty generally admitted. But it is nevertheless a maximum well established by experience and generally acknowledged, where there has been sufficient experience that the aggregate prosperity of manufacturers and the aggregate prosperity of agriculture are intimately connected. Okay, what, do, what does he mean by this? The United States is predominantly agricultural. Our manufacturing is severely limited. And there is a reason why. Contextually, when we look at context on this situation, that's because of mercantilism. All those decades of being under the British mercantilist system required that the colonies had to purchase manufactured goods from the mother country, from Britain. The colonies were prohibited to a degree to, you know, from, from man manufacturing their own goods. All they were were sources of raw material that would then be transported to the mother country in England to then be processed to be to manufacture goods, which they would then sell to the colonists. So because of that mercantilist system under uh, when the United States was, were colonies, the manufacturing sector never really developed, at least to any legitimate degree. Hamilton wants to change that. And he believes that economic prosperity of the United States depends on, a, on the growth and fostering of this manufacturing sector. And he recognizes and he appreciates the, Amer the, the American economy being dependent on agriculture. It has always been, and it still is. Even right now at this point in 1791, when he writes it, he's like, yes, but we need to start thinking about the future and we need to start promoting this sector of the economy, the manufacturing sector of the economy. And the agricultural sector will benefit that. But how do we do this? How can the federal government foster this sector of the economy? And that's where Hamilton is going to propose protective tariffs. Okay, protective tariffs are tariffs. But what are they specifically? Tariffs are designed, they are intended, constitutionally speaking, to regulate commerce and to generate revenue for the federal government. However, protective tariffs, yes. Are they a tax on imports? Yes, but they're going to be much higher. The rates on these tariffs are going to be much, much, much higher on foreign goods. Some, you know, specific foreign goods that are targeted to promote, to, to expand the, the, the domestic market. What do we mean by this, especially with the domestic production? If we talk about, let's pretend hammers. Let's pretend that the, there's a market uh, in the production of hammers. All right, hammers on a nail. The United States has been purchasing hammers from Britain. That's where they're manufactured, Britain. Uh, France manufactures hammers too. And the United States could also purchase hammers from France. They could get French hammers, they could get British hammers. JB, why don't they make American hammers? We don't have much of a manufacturing sector that hasn't been promoted, but we can change that. Here's how we can do this. By imposing high, very, very high tariffs or taxes on British hammers and French hammers, we make it much more expensive for American consumers to purchase hammers, British hammers and French hammers. What it is going to encourage or pretty much compel American consumers to do is purchase the, relative, the, the, the less expensive American hammers. That will generate revenue for the private industry of hammers, hammer manufacturers in America. With that new source of revenue, those American manufacturers of hammers will be able to expand their production, expand their manufacturing, and over time, they will become much more competitive. They'll become established and much more competitive with British and French manufacturers of hammers. And so after that time, the federal government could lower those protective tariffs on those, uh, on those British and French uh, hammers. And that way we'll have much more competition and the American manufacturers will be able to be able to compete in, 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 in that sector. And that will be all great for the consumer eventually, right? Because competition helps to lower the prices. But what also happens, the American manufacturing sector, especially for hammers, has been 
fostered, has grown, developed, it creates jobs, it creates revenue. That's his intent here. To promote the domestic industry, to develop and foster this manufacturing sector in the United States. Unfortunately, uh, the Congress will not pass this protective tariffs. They will say that I think that's going a little too far. Why? Because the major debate is going to be on the debt assumption and the bank. And this is where Jefferson and Madison are going to put up the biggest fight. And they're going to have their surrogates in Congress to try to prevent the Federalists from pushing this agenda in, in, in Hamilton's economic plan because they're afraid that it will further empower the federal government. It will undermine the principles of this republic, especially in regards to the people. It will only further enrich merchants and speculators and bankers and probably even further enrich and give more, more influence to British bankers and British creditors, which Jefferson and Madison, they can't, they despise the British. So I want to play this clip from John Adams, the John Adams series from HBO. And this is where Hamilton and Jefferson are going to pretty much establish their positions with each other. So check this out. You must find Philadelphia much change, Mr. Jefferson. More change than I could have imagined, Mr. Hamilton. Not the city itself. All cities swallow everything in their way. That's no surprise to me. That's why I abhor them. But I've been, as you know, in revolutionary France, where the streets are filled with the songs of liberty and brotherhood and the overthrow of ancient tyrannies of Europe, and to return from there to this, our cradle of revolution, and find the dinner table chatter is all of money and banks and authority is... Surprise. Jefferson it, was serving as ambassador to France. Um, he comes back. He's been, you know, appointed Secretary of State in this in this scene, and they're 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 recognizing his return and, and respecting his his new, his new capacity as a cabinet member for Washington's administration. But understand his perspective, right? He the, France is in the midst of its revolution. It's overthrowing uh, the monarchy. It's talking about liberty, all of those principles that the American Revolution fought for, right? That Jefferson was instrumental in, right? He's the author of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, he's definitely one of these uh, you know, founding fathers. He gets it. But notice what he says. Right? He comes back and he's all like, wait a minute. I, 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 I just came from one revolution and you know, based on our experiences uh, from our revolution, and and I and banks, oh, and and you know, and, and cities. I'm not too fond of cities. You know, uh, you know, he isn't. He 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 prefers he prefers the rural sector, and authority. I, what's going on here? I feel like we're regressing, right? That's that that's the impression you get here. So here we go. Unwelcome, perhaps, but necessary. I must admit, Mr. Hamilton, I am uh, a little uncertain <laughs> as to the purpose of the Treasury Department. <laughs> no doubt its function will reveal itself to me in good time. Wow. Interesting what Hamilton says there, right? Like, unfortunate, but necessary, right, in regards to banks and authority. And then Jefferson, <laughs> he's like, you know, I wonder about this Treasury Department, which, yeah, he questions even the constitutionality of the Treasury Department. And that right there is Jefferson kind of, you know, the fear, right? He's all like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? I feel like this federal government's getting a little too powerful and, and it's broadening itself. And how's Hamilton going to respond to this? The future prosperity of this nation rests chiefly in trade. Trade? depends, among other things, on the willingness of other nations to lend us money. And how would you propose to establish international credit? Our first step would be to incur a national debt. The greater the debt, the greater the credit. And to that end, I have recommended to the President that Congress adopt all the debts incurred by the individual states during the war through a national bank. The idea being that if the states owe Congress money, 
then other nations will feel more inclined to lend it to us. If the states are indebted to a central authority, it increases the power of the central government. You have it exactly. The greater the government's responsibility, the greater its authority. He has outlined his economic plan, and Jefferson responds that, hold on, that beholdens the states to the federal government, that expands the federal government's power. And Hamilton's like, yeah, that's, 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 that's what the Constitution established. This, the, you know, the, we're, the, the, why is anybody surprised by this? The moneyed interest in this country is all in the North. So the wealth and power would inevitably be concentrated there in a federal government to the expense of the South. If that is the case, it is unavoidable if the Union is to be preserved. I fear our revolution will have been in vain if a Virginia farmer is to be held in hock to a New York stock jobber, who in turn is in hock to a London banker. The opportunities for uh, Avarice and corruption would certainly prove irresistible. Well, there you have it, as I have heard said. If men were angels, then no government would be necessary. <laughs> wow. Uh, interesting that, you know, Hamilton is justifying the, his economic plan uh, and this expansion of federal government power. Jefferson is uh, relaying his concerns. Uh, interesting that he mentions that the the revolution would be in vain if we empower this federal government and be beholden to British foreign interests. What was the point of the revolution? That's Jefferson's concern here. And he's also concerned that this plan could foster corruption, greed, all of these elements that could undermine the republic and all that we fought for in the revolution. And Hamilton is, you know what Hamilton does, right? He's, he, remember, he's the co-author of the Federalist Paper, along with Madison. And Madison wrote Federalist 51. And interesting, I don't know if you caught that, but Hamilton is all like, as I've heard said, if all men were angels, no government would be necessary. That's Federalist 51. Hamilton, his rebuttal to these concerns by Jefferson, which are legitimate, right? They're, they, these are reasonable concerns. Hamilton is all like, that's why there are contingencies. There are separation of powers, there are checks and balances, even though, yes, this is strong central government, but that's why we have uh, the institutions in place, these contingencies in place, to prevent such corruption and avarice. So uh, let's, let's continue with watching this. <laughs> well, sadly, that is very well said. Uh, but there can be no question, our nation cannot bind together without powerful central government but we must also accommodate the needs of our constituent states both north and south the power of one must check and balance the other uh, to that end we must dedicate all of our energies and our care that's right i would like to Welcome, Mr. Jefferson home. Mr. Secretary of State. Yeah, yeah. Mr. President, gentlemen. There are cabinet matters that I would like to discuss. If you would excuse us, Mr. Adams. Please convey my regards to your wife. Gentlemen. John. Mr. President. Mr. President. And nothing more. <laughs> okay. So back to uh, the point about Washington and precedent. And right there at that end there in that scene where uh, John Adams refers to George Washington as Mr. President and George Washington, uh, yeah, he, he reaffirms that 
That's right. You know, Mr. President and nothing more. What was going on is that John Adams was involved in like, what do we call the president? You know, coming up with extravagant titles. And George Washington pretty much lays it out that like, Mr. President, right? He doesn't need these titles. He, you know, this, you know, his excellency, his magic, all of that. Oh, you know, British, British, right? Monarchist, Mr. President. I'm a common man. You know, that's that's you know, I gotta be modest here. That's that's one of those precedents. Okay. So this clip uh again reiterated the 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 the, the issues, the constitutional issues between Hamilton and Jefferson in regards to the debt and the bank. Uh, so how do we deal with this? How, how is this going to be solved? Well, Madison, Jefferson, and Hamilton are going to meet for dinner. They're going, they, they, they literally do this. They literally have dinner together and hash out a bargain. Here's how it works. Madison and Jefferson will be like, all right, Hamilton, I'm going to give you the bank. I'm going to give you the debt. But we want the capital of the nation to be moved to the south. Right now it's in Philadelphia. They want it in the South, and it's going to be set up uh, in what we obviously we become Washington, D.C., but it, that's right in between Maryland and Virginia, two southern states, uh, upper, upper South states, uh, those Chesapeake states, uh, two slave states, okay? But the idea by Jefferson and Madison is that that helps to keep an eye on the federal government that oh yeah it's strong well we these two states virginia maryland especially virginia that's where madison and virginia uh, and jefferson are from they're going to keep an eye on this federal government like, kind of surrounding them to be like don't get any bright ideas or clever ideas federal government we're, 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 we're surrounding you hamilton's all like okay <laughs> fine have it hamilton is not that concerned about where the capital is He's getting the debt plan. He's getting the bank. Sign, seal, deliver. All right, done. And that's your dinner table bargain. And that's how we get Hamilton's economic plan into fruition. Again, we do not have protective tariffs. We have the assumption of debt. We have the National Bank, the first bank in the United States, will be chartered for 20 years. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll manage all this collection of revenue through these tariffs and excise tax. Uh, that's 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 what's happening here. So, score for Hamilton and the Federalists on 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 these proposals. So, uh, what are we what are we getting out of this? So far, the Constitution is passing the test. It is expanding its power, by the way. All right, it is expanding its influence relative to the states. So the Federalists are you know they're they're pushing their agenda here. All right. Well. Now let's uh, let's talk about this. So let's talk about the Whiskey Rebellion because one of the issues that is going to come back <laughs> to Hamilton's economic plan is collection of revenue. Where do we generate revenue from? And Hamilton's going to suggest excise taxes. What excise tax is going to be on whiskey, American whiskey? So let's watch this clip from NBC Learn about the Whiskey Rebellion, and then we'll discuss it further. In 1794, the federal government instituted a federal liquor tax. Now, in certain localities, in what we would call then the frontier, which was western Pennsylvania, due to, of course, a almost non-existent transportation system, and also very, very uh, limited paper money, Many farmers distilled their wheat into alcohol as a way to much more easily transport it as a, in fact, as a barter, as a means of barter. And basically that was their livelihood. That's the way that they, uh, they existed. This uh, federal law threatened their lives, threatened their livelihood, and led to a mini rebellion, you could say, in western Pennsylvania among these farmers which included attacking uh, federal revenue officers and also an attempt to burn down the then new city of Pittsburgh. Washington would have none of this. He was already unhappy about anti-federalist uh, activity and dispatched Alexander Hamilton with uh, 15,000 troops to go down to Pennsylvania to put down this rebellion. By the time they arrived, most of uh, it had dissipated and nothing much came of it. They showed up there and people, you know, what, what rebellion? You know, the, the, nobody was going to speak, but this probably over time fed into the creation of the alien and sedition laws, which would then, uh, you know, greatly attack 
freedom of expression and criticism. Uh, this, this notion of both rebellion and criticism that the Federalists were extremely unhappy about. Okay. So a little reference to uh, Alien Sedition Act, we'll get to in another video, but all right. So this excise tax on whiskey, whiskey is made from grain and this, <clears throat> You know, this was this was a source of revenue for the farmers in Western Pennsylvania, and they felt that they were being targeted, and that this federal tax uh, imposed on their livelihood, as you as you saw from the video. And here we go again, right? Uh, whiskey rebellion. Okay, what's the whiskey rebellion about? If we had to if we had to describe this generally, disgruntled, angry Western farmers attacking officers and policies as established by, according to them, Eastern elites, in this case, the federal government. I swear I've heard this story before. That's right. I heard it in Bacon's Rebellion in the Virginia colony. I heard it in Shea's Rebellion in the state of Massachusetts. And here we go again, now the Whiskey Rebellion. By the way, it, one way that you can try to remember these rebellions, right, between Western farmers and Eastern elites, uh, think of it alphabetically. Bacon with a B, Shays with an S, whiskey with a W. Okay. So this is the test, right? Shays' rebellion tested the merits of the Articles of Confederation, the national government under the Articles, and the national government failed. The Shays' rebellion exposed the weakness of the Articles of Confederation. But will the whiskey rebellion do this to the Constitution? No. No, that was not with Washington as president and not with this strong constitution, right, that establishes this central government of, you know, further empowered. What can Congress do now? It can raise an army and a navy, and that's what it can do. It makes the president the commander in chief. Uh, Congress can, and the president can federalize the militia here in Pennsylvania. That's what Washington does. He federalizes them. He basically turns them into a federal army troop. And he is going to order Hamilton to lead these troops, uh, these federalized troops, to the to Western Pennsylvania, engage, uh, really meet, but you know have to engage these uh, these rebels, and quash this insurrection. And when Hamilton personally leads on behalf of the President of the United States as Commander in Chief, the, <laughs> the Western farmers, uh, you know, you know. In, in, participating in this rebellion, quickly realized, wait, 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 who, what? Washington? Troops? Better. Oh, no, <laughs> JK, no, 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 <laughs> sorry. No, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. we were kidding, JK. No, it's a joke, joke. No, the tarring and the feathering and attacking the, the tax collectors, the federal tax collectors. No, 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 misunderstanding everybody. Why, why are we even doing this? Why are we here? No, 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 yeah. This show of force by Washington, right? What does it do? It asserts that federal authority. It asserts the Constitution power. It demonstrates that the Constitution is legit and that the, the federal government's not going to tolerate this kind of uh, you know, insurrection, this rebellion. No, 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 no. Right? This is about the rule of law. Let's think about this, everyone. Let's think about this. Now, the Western Pennsylvania farmers, what are they going to be mad at, right? They're going to be mad at about the federal government imposing a tax on their livelihood. This could remind them of what, right? Parliament imposing taxes on the colonists, right? And, 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 and threatening their livelihood, right? This is, this is what it's all about. You know, like, uh, taxa no taxation without representation. Hold up there, though. Hold up there. But there is representation. Yeah, Washington is going to make the argument that um, this excise tax passed by the federal government, imposed by the federal government, yeah, this was proposed in the House of Representatives. It was passed by a majority of the House of Representatives who are directly elected by the people. It was then passed by a majority of the Senate, which was elected by the state legislatures who are elected by the people in, in some degree. I signed it into law. So it was checked and it needs to be followed. This is law and federal law supersedes anyone's authority 
and it must be followed. And I'm enforcing that law. And if somebody wants to, uh, you know, disobey that law and attack tax collectors, no, 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 no. As commander in chief, I need to protect the tax collectors. I need to enforce the law. And that's what I'm doing here. And that's why I'm leading these troops into this region to quash this lawlessness. All right. Good job. Now, hold on. They violated the law. Uh, some will be some. Some of these leaders could be branded traitors. Uh, yeah, they attacked uh, federal tax collectors. Uh, they, you know, they resorted to violence on this. They should be severely punished, uh, according to some, right? That's reasonable. And some will even call for them to, for the leader, especially the leaders of this rebellion, to be executed. Uh, this. this George Washington does not entertain any of that. Uh, no. I mean, are some of them going to be put on trial? Yes. But that's what they, that's, that's what people deserve. That's what they are entitled to. Right to trial. Due process. And Washington is not going to assume the authority as commander in chief and summarily execute them. Absolutely not. That's not how, no, that's not how it works. And you know what? He's also going to argue that. <clears throat> This the, to refrain from this type of punishment to go this far to go to this extreme to try to make some example, right? To 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 justify the the force of the federal government it's unnecessary. They were upset with the law. They petitioned for redress of grievances. They expressed their disdain for this law. Did some of them take it too far? Yes, and they will be punished accordingly through due process. But the people have a right to protest the policies of their federal government. And that's why no one's gonna die. And that's why no one is going to be summarily punished. Cool, I can go with that, right? That's, that's, that's in, yeah, there we go. Excellent. Now, are there concerns with this approach that Washington took, right? Now that seems wise, but he did, right? He federalized the Pennsylvania militia state militia, and sent troops against Western farmers, against citizens of the United States. Thomas Jefferson is not cool with it. Why? Because he's concerned about standing armies. He does not like the idea of the federal government having such authority and such force being imposed against the people. So this is, you know, he's, he's again concerned Concerned about where the direction is going with this federal government. But we can, again, come out of this and say the Constitution passes the test. It passes the test. Are there any further tests to this? Yeah, there are. There's still, we have, but so far, so good. And actually, I think we could even have some confidence in the capability of this federal government under the Constitution of the United States. So good job, Washington. All right. Let's now go to In seven uh, Washington is going to be unanimously reelected. He's going to go with a second term. Yeah, four years row. That was quick, right? Uh, also. John Adams will repeat as uh, vice president. He's a little bit more competitive, though, because guess who's, guess who's now in existence? The Republicans. The anti-administration faction of Congress has consolidated under the leadership and guidance of Thomas Jefferson as the Republican Party, in opposition to the Federalist agenda, uh, in opposition to Hamilton's agenda. And so they're gonna they're gonna put up some uh, gonna put up some competition. Uh, Adams, you can see that, yeah. I mean George Clinton, uh, Republican, he's uh, yeah, almost you know. That's a considerable amount compared to the election of 1788. But no matter, we're, we're consistent with the administration. George Washington's back in charge. John Adams is uh, the vice president. But John Adams is going to lean more toward federalist policy. Okay. So, speaking of, uh, of this foreign policy, we will discuss this uh, in regards to uh, you know, how the Washington administration is going to deal with and how the Adams administration is also going to deal with 
the legacy of the Washington administration when it comes to foreign policy and another video series, our final video series uh, regarding the early republic under the Washington and Adams administration. So please stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, y'all have a good time.